Hi, Dave here. Hello there. Good afternoon and welcome to The Pulse. We are coming to you live from our studios here in Accra. Don't forget that we are live on your digital terrestrial TV because we are free to air. You can catch us live on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. This is Joy News Independent, Fearless and Credible. Coming up this afternoon on The Pulse, majority in Parliament is calling on the Speaker to reject the motion of rescission filed by the minority chief whip Muntaka Mubarak challenging the speaker's decision to refer three NPP MPs to the Privileges Committee. ...to express uh, disagreement with the chief whip for the minority in his own understanding of what the rules provide. Well, stay with us. We'll take you to the Upper West region as well as the police there has uh, arrested two more suspects in connection with an attack on the new patriotic party's Nasara coordinator for Sisala West constituency, Musa Idrisu. Unfortunately, they could not complete the exercise and have agreed to start from Desme the next day. The constituency executives rather went to Fatu instead of Desme as agreed with the regional reps. Well, we have details from the relatives as well uh, on the status of the victim, plus here from the wife here on the polls. And don't forget as well that we are keeping our eyes on this. Prices of eggs are set to go up by some 30% in the coming days. So here this afternoon on the polls from the National Association of Poultry Farmers has announced an upward adjustment of retail prices. My name is Blessed Sogan. The Pulse, as always, is brought to you by Global Communities Digni Lu, Affordable Safe Sanitation. We're streaming this afternoon on all of our social media handles at Join News on TV and also on YouTube as well. Feel free to join us with the hashtag The Pulse. My personal handle is at Blessed Sogan. Thanks for choosing us. Welcome to The Pulse. Well, so this afternoon, let's take you to Parliament. The majority leader, also AJ Mensah Bonsu, is asking the Speaker to reject the motion of rescission filed by the Minority Chief Whip, Muntaka Mubarak, challenging the Speaker's decision to refer three NPP MPs to the Privileges Committee. He says the move by Muntaka is not grounded in law. He also believes it will be a Herculean task for the NDC to convince the Supreme Court as well that the e-levy was approved on dubious grounds. This came up at a press conference held by the majority this afternoon. The parliamentary correspondent for us, Becca Wilson, has been monitoring the situation and now comes through with this report. The majority leader, Sir Chairman Sabonso, is not too happy with some moves made by his colleagues on the other side, particularly the minority chief, Ramunta Kamubarak. He believes that the motion of rescission filed by the minority chief whip is not grounded in law. I think it's important to express uh, disagreement with the chief web for the minority in his own understanding of what the rules provide. A speaker can receive petitions from our side. And indeed, as you are all aware, demonstrators come to parliament to present petitions. Who do they, who do they submit the petitions to or do they intend to submit the petitions to, to the speaker? And because the speaker would ordinarily be presiding, he would oftentimes um, send the majority leader and the minority leader to go and receive the petitions on his behalf and submit the petitions to him. Once we receive the petitions, we relay same to the speaker without any personal comments. Usually we say to them that, well, uh, the petitioning the speaker will submit the petition to the speaker. We can only assure that the appropriate steps will be taken to deal with the contents of the, um, of the petition that you are submitting. When the speaker receives such a petition, the speaker is, um, you know, within his remit after perusing the document to refer same to the appropriate committee for further investigation. So when my colleague said that he disagrees that the speaker cannot receive petitions, I was wondering where he was deriving his strength from. Because clearly, by practice, by convention, speakers everywhere in the world receive petitions. And when they so receive petitions, they channel them to the appropriate committees in parliament. He also raised concerns about the attempt to injunct the commencement of the implementation of the e-levy. His view is that the president has already assented to it and that it will be an exercise in fertility if the minority 
attempts to injunct the levy? Well, I'll just say that the burden of proof lies on the, on the uh, minority to go to court and, and prove their case. The Supreme Court, I'm sure, no Supreme Court anywhere, indulges in processes and procedures relating to Parliament. That is their matter. Let them take it to court to uh, litigate. But I believe that it will be a Herculean task on their part to convince and persuade whoever. They say they want to stop the implementation. But the bill is already being implemented. I don't know what they mean by that. Upon the assent of the president, a bill, if parliament has not postponed the operation of the bill, immediately after the assent, it comes to, into operation. So if you fall foul to it, you can be prosecuted for falling foul to a bill that has been assented by the president. I don't want to pronounce on it, uh, but I guess you and I will know that um, secondly being an exercise in futility. He's also been responding to the concerns about whether or not Joseph Osewu should be in the first uh, deputy speaker and also the chairman of the presidency committee has the look and the right to preside over the sitting that will give hearing to the three MPP and peace uh, who have been directed to appear before them and answer some questions over their absence in parliament. Now, I see a challenge in that in that matter because the first deputy speaker is named by the orders to chair the committee. So if you are if you are insisting that the first deputy speaker shouldn't chair, are you going to amend the standing orders to accommodate another person to be the chair? That's point number one. Point number two, if any member is conflicted, maybe so he has some interest in the business that is uh, referred to a committee, that person can opt out to say that, no, this matter has come before us of a personal interest, so I'm opting out. But once he does that, it is for the caucus to replace him. And that's the rule. So unless maybe you don't know about that, if you say that with the... The minority is yet to respond to the claims being made by the majority leader. For Joy News, I am Chrissy Parker Wilson. Well, so Paka Wilson giving us the very latest uh, from Parliament. We're set to get a reaction coming through from minority on this matter. We're equally challenging the claims. But first, let's uh, hear from Parliamentary Monitoring Group, Odikru. Nehemiah Tiga is co-founder of that group. They were present at that press conference as well. So I'm sure that by now, uh, Nehemiah, you've been assessing the claims by the majority leader. Let's start off on the issue of the conduct of MPs, issues of absenteeism. Uh, having heard the majority leader on the matter, do you feel that indeed uh, the Speaker needs to rescind his decision on referring these three MPs to the Privileges Committee? I mean, the Speaker does not need to rescind his decision. And think about it, um, he receives petitions. And when you receive a petition, you have to take action. Um, there has never been an occasion where an MP in breach of Article 97 Clause 1C have been summoned before the Privileges Committee of Parliament um, to explain the chronic absenteeism I mean, without written permission to the Speaker, or even ask to vacate their seats as, as the Constitution recommends. And, and so, if, if uh, obviously, if they, are, they fail to um, provide any plausible reasons. Now, this, this lack of action has set a certain precedence and has more or less encouraged a certain level of impunity among um, members of parliament or some members of parliament. So if this action has been taken, this action is one of the best actions. And so I don't think the speaker should rescind the decision in any way. This, this should go ahead. The committee should make. In fact, we, we would wish that the committee sits in um, publicly for everybody to see how they, how they carry out their inquiries. And that would that will actually help our democratic dispensation or participatory democracy to a large extent. I guess the concern of Muntaka Mubarak was about the approach of the speaker. 
Is it not justified in, in making that demand of challenging the decision of the Speaker to refer these three MPs based on what he claims is a public petition and not from in-house, not from within the chamber itself? Um, so if, but if the public are allowed to petition the Speaker or petition Parliament to the Speaker, then the Speaker should be able to refer petitions to the appropriate um, committees as as the as their standing orders recommend or as the constitution recommends. So the speaker is right in his action, hundred percent right. Uh, indeed, uh, Nehemiah, there are more issues to, um, of course, deal with. Uh, let's also bring in Roxy Nelson of who's uh, the South Dangan MP and also a member of the Legal Committee in Parliament. So uh, first of all, you've been listening to the justifications by the majority leader on, on two critical issues. The e levy as well has come up. The majority leader says. Looking at what's happening in court, he does not believe that your side will be able to sustain your grounds, the grounds for which the e-levy should not be implemented on May 1. What's your take on that? Uh, Roxanne Nelson, uh, me, if you can ask, uh, uh, hear me. Yes, right. Just, yes, go ahead, sir. Uh, first of all, let me say good afternoon to your um, listeners. We are, on, we, are on, we are on FM, right? Hello? Yes, yes. Well, the, we on well the polls, yes. So, join you, yes. Okay. Now, secondly, it's not correct that the the bill having been assented to by, um, by the president has become law. Um, the executive itself has suspended the implementation of the law and deferred it to a future date, which is the first day of, of May. And let me give you other instances. You recall the passage of the Right to Information Act. Mm -hmm. it, it, Parliament passed the law, but the executive decided to um, defer the implementation with a provision in the law by Parliament. So it took, it took the executive a whole year to implement that law. You recall the fact that we have the Road Fund Act in operation. But the executive has given an order to suspend the implementation of an aspect of the law, which is the tooling of our roads. So it is not correct that when, as soon as a law is passed by parliament, it cannot be suspended, its implementation cannot be suspended by the executive nor by the legislature uh, uh, um, or by the judiciary. What we are saying is that the president has assented to the law. It's become a law, properly so called. The its implementation has been deferred by the executive itself. And so, to that extent, we are asking the judiciary to defer the implementation further until the, the matter before it in respect of the constitutionality of the procedures leading to its passage into law is determined. How is this question on that? Just a brief question Adam, on that. As it stands now, is the E-Levy law or still at the consideration stage? The E-Levy the e is no law. It's not being implemented. It's not How? law or it's not being implemented? Give us it's, clarity it's to law. that. It's law. It is law, so it must be enforced, on, I guess. Hold on. Technically speaking, but it is not implemented. Implementation of the law is what makes it law. When the law is suspended, it is no law, properly so called. So, for instance, today, if I if I if I if I engage in electronic transfer, mm. I am not taxed pursuant to the the terms and the tenor of the law. Okay, then uh, we'll so see. You, 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 you understand my point? Yeah, I get your point. So we'll see how yeah. that would definitely pan out in in, in court, but. Uh, the concern as well has so, been about. So I, I am yeah. rather, I am, I, I was rather hoping that the majority leader mm. would have commented on the matter. Okay, and anyway, would have uh, said, but obviously would have these are that, these on. are matters that will be decided by, by the court. So, yeah, but, so I would have said right. that we will leave that in the hands of the Supreme Court to determine Pre precisely. on the fourth of May. Precisely, uh, but but your colleagues as well, their conduct in, uh, on the floor with regard to attendance has also come up. He believes that um, your minority. Chief Whip Muntaka Mubarak is seeking to challenge the Speaker, his decision to refer three MPP MPs to the Privileges Committee. Uh, you believe that the majority is justified in, in what they are asking the Speaker to do, to, to rescind that decision that 
Mutakaya's petition for? I am the first, I'm the first that has said, indeed on your channel, that the my minority chief we've got it wrong. The speaker got everything right in law, in terms of procedure and the substantive law. Indeed, the speaker proceeded under order order fifty three sub one sub D or so, I, I I think so, by way of statement to the House. The speaker didn't say that because he received a petition from some person from outside, he was proceeding to refer the matter to the appropriate committee. No. Mm. He said the matters have come to his knowledge and attention. Okay. Okay? By petition and other means. You know, there have been publications on this matter. Mm. People have written extensively on that absenteeism and and brought the details to light. So Muntaka may not be right in his challenge against Munt the speaker. But my, my chief, we've got it wrong. He's wrong in terms of the procedure, in terms mm. of the law. The speaker has the right to make a statement to the House and pursue on to making that statement, mm. refer any matter right. arising out of that statement mm. right. in the House to the appropriate committee. Okay then. Okay then. Uh, Roxanne Nelson, Dapiamako, thank you. But Nehemiah, you are still with us. Also help us with this. What, what, what's the procedure uh, and in terms of the standing orders? Uh, how, where do we go from here? Are we expecting that once Parliament returns to its businesses, uh, the Parliament, the Speaker, and all of its um, organs will be triggered to hear this particular case involving the three NPP MPs? Okay, so um, once the Speaker has referred the the, the issue to the Privileges Committee, they would have to sit on it and also go through the process of inquiring from these MPs to get any form of reasons why they have absented themselves over that period of that over 15 number of sittings without permission. And then they would submit their report and which would, um, so there's some argument that should it be discussed or should it be voted on at the plenary. Again, I would say that no, because these folks never made any effort to trigger that motion to refer any of their colleagues to the Privileges Committee until the Speaker said so. So at this point, the only thing that's going to happen is going to go through that committee of inquiry by the Privileges Committee, and then they will submit their report. Um, Hopefully, um, we would see something different happen where we get to the point where punitive measures to the point of what the constitution recommends, where people would end up vacating their seats um, for by elections to take place or for, for those who are ready and willing to represent their constituents to do so. Um, you, can, you can look at various factors. Um, for instance, Henry Corte is an MP minister, so it could be that the issue where we think that Article um, 78 then makes the president appoint these folks who are M who are MPs, ministers, and then they end up doing double jobs, and that affects their job as MPs come under the under the under the spotlight. We can also look at a situation where maybe legitimately Ajua Safu may have um, absented himself for medical reasons, but then the day whatever it is, the rules say that you have to be absent with permission. Yeah. We, we find ourselves in a place where we have the opportunity to reform our parliament, and that's what should happen. And I think the speaker has that opportunity to do so. So some of his decisions may look out of place, but actually once he has the power and once he's aligned to the law and the rules of the house, I mm. think we should support him to, to transform and reform our parliament. What's interesting is that we have the majority sustaining this. The resultant effect is that we may lose three NPP MPs from the majority side. That, that would definitely affect their business going forward and make things tougher for them because we, we're not guaranteed of the outcome of the by-election should it happen. Don't you think well, that the majority well, should well, be concerned well, about, about that as well? Well, I mean, the, the majority understands they may also get in three MPs um, if, if by election was to take place, maybe they also get three new MPs who would be efficient at doing their work, who would ensure that they follow the rules of the House as well. So um, <laughs> the uncertainty and the unknown, we can't say anything about. But truth is, you would expect that, yes, the majority will be concerned about that. Um, at the same time, they also understand that even when the people are members of parliament, maybe their 
absent or being truant affects their output as 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 a, as a caucus or as a majority. So, in effect, whether you are there or not, you, you you do not add any value to their side. So maybe if they were to get in people who would actually um, support their work by making sure that they are present or even if they are absent absent with permission, then that that's the way to go for them. So you can look at it in in different ways depending on which side you sit on. All right, then. Uh, I'm grateful that you've been able to spend some time with us. Nehemiah Tigan, co-founder of Parliamentary Monitoring Group, Odikro. Well, we need to talk about the economy now. You need to prepare to pay more for eggs in the coming days because the Poultry Farmers Association says it is adjusting the price of eggs by 30% to keep afloat. Now, you see uh, details of the pricing now on your screens, and we know that now a crate of small eggs is going for 30 Ghana cities and a crate of unsorted eggs uh, will now go for some 32 Ghana cities. That's the indication uh, we're getting from the association. Uh, the price build-up will be broken down for you shortly, but this will mean a single unit of an egg at retail price will now be sold at one city 50 pesos. So, joining me now in studio is the national president of the Poultry Farmers Association, Victor Opongiche, who's uh, going to help us. Um, break this down. Let's uh, first of all give you a breakdown of the figures and, and what the implications uh, will be for you in terms of how much you need to pay and what that will mean for you as an individual consumer out there. But uh, we need to welcome you, Victor, into our studios. It's good to see you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to say this is a good time to see you because it will mean that if I'm coming for your services, I need to raise up and pay more. Why are you increasing your prices now? Thank you very much. Uh, we are doing that because prices of inputs have gone up drastically. Uh, let me start by saying that poultry is all about the feed. If there is no feed, there is no poultry. And we have some basic ingredients that we use to prepare the feed. Maize, soya, wheat bran, and other ingredients. That they, are, they are the most important ones. Uh, if you are preparing a ton of feed, mm -hmm you need about 50 to 60 percent of maize. Yeah. Then uh, between 15 to 25 percent of soya, then 15 to 20 percent of wheat bran. Now, maize that we were buying at 65 cities per 50 kilowatt in 2020, now is 180 Ghana cities per the same weight, which is an increment of, in percentage wise, is about 277 percent. The, so the soya was 150 Ghana cities per 50 kilowatt, mm -hmm. and it is now 305 Ghana cities. That one too is over 200 percent. So basically, the cost of production is shooting up by the day. It's gone up over 200 percent. But but some would say, I mean, this is what you see everywhere you go. The economy is not in really a good shape. Ghanaians are even have, have, having uh, struggling to make, make up for uh, the increment in transport fares and other services as well. Yours is some way, somehow, a, a very essential product, if you do agree. This is about protein and about good health as well. So why not be patient for Ghanaians to readjust and then you could go ahead with the increment in the prices? We did that in order to sustain the industry. Okay. The industry is virtually collapsed. Uh, we have farmers who are having about 300,000 bears a stock, but they now have 50, just 50,000. And even that feeding them is a problem. Yesterday, one of the farmers called me from Eastern Region. He was having 52,000 bears capacity. Now he has only 700. If you go around the farms, you will see that most of the farms are empty because Farmers are piling up debts. A farmer loses about 5,000 Ghana cities a day, which comes to 150,000 a month. So if we do not do the uh, upward adjustment of egg prices, mm. it means in the next couple of months, we will not get a single poultry farmer in the country. Okay, so let's do this. Let, let's try and give you a breakdown of the figures and what it will mean to you as an average consumer out there so that uh, the national president will deal with that. So what you have on your screens now is the uh, unsalted and then small. Yeah. So give us a sense of what, what the unsalted means. That, that's now going to cost some 
32 Ghana cities. Exactly. What's the unsorted? What's the the unsorted, unsorted comprises of uh, the big, small, and the medium. Okay. And the small one is when the bear starts, the eggs, is, uh, the eggs are small. Right. So with time, you see that it will be enlarged. Mm -hmm. So we are saying that the small is going up for 30 cities mm -hmm. and the unsorted for 32 cities. Is this something we're going to have uniform, uniformly implemented across um, I mean, the country? Because the challenge is, once you're giving a signal that the prices are rising, the prices are going up, then some of your colleagues as well will take advantage of this. And, and the prices may even shoot up beyond the 32 and 30 range. Uh, how, are, how are you dealing with that? Really? Actually, we are sensitizing our people mm -hmm. as to how they should go about it. Right. And we even said that uh, the new prices should start after the Ramadan, so that we use the, the, the period between now and the Ramadan to uh, uh, sensitize the people and the public. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't do that, uh, it means that uh, we, we, we will have to import eggs, which will not be good, mm. because poultry is also creating a lot of jobs. And many farmers are now uh, laying off their workers. Is that bad? Sorry? The situation is that bad? Very bad. Very, very bad. If you go around Achima area, mm. we have about 42 farms over there. Now, 35 are not in operation. 35 out of the 42. Mm. And it goes round and round, round around the country. Mm. You see, so the situation is getting out of hands. Right. So the only thing we can do is to adjust prices so that farmers can meet their cost of production mm -hmm. and save a little money. If you look at the components of the cost of production, there's also feed that you're talking about, um, issues that have got to do with government policies in terms of importation and all of that, because I'm sure that the feeds, most of them, you, you, you import them from, from outside this country. Is that, yes. is that correct? Yes, so, so, but so the, 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 the basic one right. is the maize that we get from here. From, from, from within. Luka, Luka, yeah. But then what could possibly avert this imminent increment in, in prices? Is there anything government could do in terms of policies to deal with this, to avert the increment? Yes, you know, government came out with a policy called planting for food and jobs, which was very good. Uh, before the planting for food and jobs, the maize farmers were having a yield of about two metric tons per hectare. Mm -hmm. And af after the planting for food and jobs, the yield increased from two metric tons to six metric tons, which was very good. So we were expecting the prices of maize to either st stabilize or come down. Mm -hmm. Because if you're having two and now you have six, it means it has multiplied right. about three times. Mm -hmm. And we allowed the neighboring countries Burkina Faso, Mali, Togo, Benin, uh, Nigeria, to come in to buy the maize from us. The maize that has been subsidized by the government. You know, planting for food and jobs, yeah. money so, went so in. Smuggling is also affecting, I, I, indirectly. It, that, that's what's happening. It's, that's it's what's an happening. open market. Right. They come right. here, they just load their cars and okay. they, they take it off. Right. But so, so you would want some restrictions in, in that regard? Exactly. I think the gov government has come out with that restriction. How about subventions as well? Because we know that uh, if government comes through with, with a sub subvention package or some subsidies, that could also lower your cost of production. Uh, Is that a feasible uh, attempt in, in dealing with... with yes, we've made that attempt. We've mm -hmm. told the government to right. give subsidy so that like, we will not increase our prices. Okay. But it's not forthcoming. And we, all, we can only sustain the industry when we also adjust prices. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, all the poultry farms in the country w w will collapse. Beyond the 32 and 30 cities range, um, what forecast are you making? Are there some dynamics that could change and significantly reduce the prices that we're seeing now in the coming days? What do you think? As for about? reduction, I doubt, because we are even anticipating that the maize price will get to, 200, yeah, it will go, get to 200 Ghana cities mm -hmm. very soon. Mm -hmm. Because much as the prices have gone up, availability is also a problem. Mm -hmm. We are not getting the maize. So it's a challenge. And in that wise, you see that you can only get it when prices, the price goes up. Mm -hmm. People are now trying to hold their maize because they are still expecting a higher price right. for the maize. Right. So it makes it very difficult 
for us as farmers because the more the prices goes up, it will mean that we also have to adjust our prices. What would be the will implications, be for instance, if um, we cross the 200 cities mark for maize? Are you scared that your businesses may collapse? Definitely, because we cannot continue to increase egg prices. People will stop even eating eggs. And in that wise, you cannot buy the maize at that price to produce. Right. And it will be a challenge. For now, there are a lot of Ghanaians watching us, and uh, some would also be wondering if you are open to the idea of further delaying the increment in the prices uh, and waiting for some factors to change. Um, what, what's being blamed on all of this, partly, has got to do with the Ukraine-Russia tension and all of that. Is that also related to this? Could that, if you delay it, don't you feel that the factors may change, which could significantly no, impact I, I, I don't think it will change because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the maize prices started going up at the latter part of 2020. And we alerted the ministry that, hey, this is what is going, going on. on right. We should stop. So you've been actually been in touch with the ministry on, on this? We've had a series of meetings. It all borders on allowing the, for, uh, the neighboring countries to come and buy our local maize. It means that the government subsidy, we, the Ghanaian, we Ghanaian did not benefit. Mm. It's only the, the, for, uh, the, the, neighboring, the foreigners yeah. who benefited. Because government subsidized uh, the maize production mm -hmm. through fertilizer supplies and uh, technical men. Right. And in that case, we should have benefited. Now, if you go to the market to buy kenke, mm -hmm. kenke, which was 50 pesos, is now about two cities. Right. And it's not only poultry that is suffering. Mm -hmm. Kenke sellers, banku sellers, they are all in the okay. same situation. Uh, so, so what you're telling me now is that there's an engagement between your association and the agri ministry. Yeah. What did the minister tell you? Well, it was a stakeholder meeting that we have. And we told them, as I'm saying now, that this is the situation. But, you know, we are also operating in an open market system. And it's very difficult for the for the ministry to come just to stop the people from buying. But fortunately, about a week or two, the government has come out through the Minister of Food and Agriculture, the Minister of Trade and Industry, that there will be no more exportation of maize and soya, which is good for us. Mm -hmm. But now the, the, the commodities are not there. We are expecting the next year to see how it will go. So let's look at some of the policy interventions, particularly within the poultry industry. Uh, just somewhere last year, the Agric Ministry had announced that there was a grand plan of um, bringing in some foreign investors. I'm sure that you've had that, that arrangement yeah. and supporting local producers as well. Uh, how far with that arrangement and what, what's your analysis and assessment of, of uh, that approach that government was using uh, since last year? Well, I think uh, it would be good to inject money in the, in the poultry industry. Yeah. It's not only the egg production alone. We should also consider the broiler production. Right. Uh, importation of frozen chicken has taken over 99% of the broiler market. market right. We are virtually not producing, only just few people. Somewhere in 2020, I think over $500 million was used to import chicken into the country. So if you invest in the poultry, it means we are going to stop the importation, which also put pressure on the dollar exchange. Right. You know, $500 million is not a joke. So it's good to get investors to invest more in the poultry industry so that we can have our local production. Right. Uh, and just as we wrap up, uh, I don't know what, what your thoughts would be on this. The belief is that this is about the markets. And once you increase price, the resultant effect that is that demand would definitely decrease. Are you not worried that that would further jeopardize your, your businesses? Not at all, because... The, the fact that demand would, would drop. No, would it will not drop. Price, we are still much. within the range. Okay. As we speak now, one, a single egg is sold at one city 50 pesos. Some are even selling it at two cities. So a crate of egg comes to 45 cities. Right. So if we increase our egg to 30 cities, between the, the, the farmer 
and the consumer, there's still a margin of 15 cities, which, will be, which can, uh, can be shared among the middlemen over there. You're, so it you're would... basically telling us you've been considerate. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're trying to tell us. It should have been up more, more than Exactly. 30, we, 30, we, 30, we, 30, we, 30. we were trying to push it to 35 cities, but we, 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 we decided to come to this price and expecting that if impulse goes down, we will come down. Right. But if it continues to go up, it will be a challenge. We have to go up. Anyway, we'll have to leave the conversation here, but thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you, too. Victor Ajay is National President of the Poultry Farmers Association. Uh, let's stay on the agric sector, because crop uh, science researchers at the University of Ghana have agreed on the need for a compelling uh, case of uh, actually in investments into the food value chain. Uh, involving some six staples following the war in Ukraine, uh, which is affecting the agricultural sector. Director of Research at the West Africa Center for Crop Improvement, Professor Eric Dankwa, uh, has been speaking to my colleague Samuel Kujobrace at a high-level emergency consultative meeting to deliberate on food and nutrition security in the country. Even before COVID-19 and the Ukraine war, most countries in Africa were not on the right path. They were not on the path to meet the Sustainable Development Goal too. And so even about three years ago, countries in the sub-region had to do something about science, technology and innovation to increase the productivity of the crops that feed the people so that there will be food self-sufficiency. Of course, largely a number of countries have relied on imports to, if you like, um, supplement. Um, what we are doing now is to ensure that we create the awareness which ensures that partners understand that we have the innovations around that if we scaled up would meet expectations in farmers' fields. And so the time is now urgent because of the complicating factors. Of course, the Ukraine-Russia war it's a signal, of course, but there have been so many other signals like climate change, an important signal, COVID-19, and no one knows tomorrow. That is why we are moving forward in the context of Ghana looking within to meet expectations. So uh, it's urgent for us to think about saving on the import bill on food. Are you now cycling our minds towards GMOs? Because... Um, We've been made to understand per the presentations made so far that the current seedlings or the seeds available are no more adaptive as um, compared to others. The new crops that you have identified, is that the situation? Um, we have not talked about GMOs today. We have talked about hybrid maize and for example hybrid tomato which are important for changing the game. But of course, the GMO story is another story um, which African countries have to look at in the fullness of time. In Nigeria, there has been, if you like, the approval uh, to, if you like, cowpea with resistance against the Maruka pest. And Ghana has to think forward, look forward. I mean, genetic modification is not per se a bad thing. We have to look at it and ensure that we have the understanding and, of course, the policy environment and also the regulation allow us to go forward in using of those, if you like, uh, plants. Nonetheless, in this conversation we've been talking about um, hybrid maize, hybrid tomato, which are common globally. Okay then, so let's assess um, what it is that we need to do to invest in these three staples. Joining us now uh, via Zoom is CEO for Agribusiness Agri Ghana, Anthony Morrison. Thank you, sir, for your time. So here we are. Almost every situation within the agro-industry agro has been blamed on the Russian-Ukrainian uh, war. Is that entirely the case? Particularly when we know that uh, things were not too good for us even before this uh, escalation. I, I perfectly agree with uh, uh, my good friend, Professor Eric Dampoir, right. uh, before the COVID uh, and also the Ukraine war, uh, we haven't seen much of that preparedness of most African countries, especially Ghana. And uh, we also therefore do not have um, a pandemic uh, relief mechanism or resilience. So uh, we were actually in a position not to fight any kind of shocks 
that will come into our industry. So for that matter, we are having to look for short-term uh, mitigation systems to solve our current problems. So I think that um, even though we have also inflicted some of these uh, challenges on our own selves, uh, there is a need to go back to the drain board and uh, like what they are doing uh, with the strategic meeting they are having now, uh, these are some of the ongoing intervention from both the academia and the private sector to find a way to address uh, some of these challenges. Uh, so let's talk about the three staples and, and how to consistently deal with the issue of shortage. For instance, there's maize uh, as well, um, just gone by with the uh, Poultry Farmers Association who are in fact complaining about how our neighboring countries are taking advantage of the government policies in, uh, within the country. Um, so how do we address that really? Is it the case that there is generally shortage or it's, we need to be more protective in our approach towards production? Well, we have always imported maize. Uh, for instance, um, 2023, uh, 2022-2023, uh, our projections, and uh, as also stated by the United States Department for Agriculture was mm. Uh, 12 point, uh, 2 point, uh, 5 metric tons. All right. um, last year, we imported quite about 300,000 300, metric tons of maize, uh, primarily for the uh, poultry industry, which is the largest employer. What we should be doing now is how we can mitigate some of this. First, do our farmers uh, get what they require, especially when it comes to mechanization? Mm. It takes time for them to access mechanization services. Then also, do they get the right seeds? Uh, Professor Danko was talking about hybrid seeds. Right. So do they get the hybrid seeds? And do they also get the required fertilizers? Because application of fertilizers ought to be done in three um, stages, uh, the right quantity, the right time, and um, the time of application and all mm. that. So these are key. However, there is also an increasing uh, amount of post-harvest losses on the farms. As a result of the, the poor growth, the bad nature of the road. Sometimes it takes one week to drag a truck load of uh, maize from the farm onto the main road. And sometimes uh, most farmers are unable to go back to the farm to uh, move some of this maize right. or produce onto the market. Right. So there are quite an enormous uh, problem with regards uh, to post harvest. Uh, given, the, the, given the figures that you have with you, what's our status food security wise? Well, uh, our buffer stock currently, I, I, I don't know the current date, but uh, uh, the, the last figure we saw cannot even take the country even with uh, one month. So we need to uh, get uh, the military. I have always insisted that we need to get the military into agriculture. We need to get the prisons into agriculture. And we, we need to make sure that we support them actively. Because in other jurisdictions, some of the things we are using in agriculture today uh, in developed countries were done and developed by the military. So we need to go into it. Like for instance, the drones we are using, the sensors we are using, some of the huge machines for harvesting and tillers were all uh, produced by the military. So we need to get the military in uh, our agriculture to support food security because issues of food security is a national security issue. Uh, however, in, we have also seen some tax areas where they are also being of a border. For instance, the reduction of the benchmark value, the higher cost of imports, uh, the depreciation of the Ghana CD, the rising inflation, which is currently at 9.4, and some other taxes that you have to pay mm. at the port when you are importing some of the inputs that are required for productivity. Right. So there is a, a lot of work that needs to be done. However, Government now needs to support a lot of commercial farmers. Mm. I'm saying commercial farmers here because they can then be used as a pivot to support the, the, the smallholder farmers. Direct support for the smallholder farmers is not working. So let's use the commercial farmers, All right, support so. them heavily because they can then, uh, what we call it, take up the guarantee mm. and make sure that they deliver what they are being invested into. Uh, in fact, I was going to mention um, national service, <laughs> but, but then I realized that, 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 I mean, this is a service which is already grappling with a number of challenges, but what, what do you think about that? Using the service personnel, uh, changing their focus and pushing much more of the human resource there into issues of a Greek, is that feasible? 
Yes, the national service is also another way out. Uh, in other jurisdictions like South Africa, they have introduced a, a youth policy where they are actually paying the farms, giving money to the commercial farms who are paying the youth who are working on these commercial farms because it's an issue of food security. So we can also adopt a similar measure. It's, it's, um, they, they call it, I think, energy for food or something like that. Mm. So uh, these are some of the things you need to do. Unfortunately, in our case, uh, national service are losing some of their farms. Uh, currently, I think they have lost about five of their major farms. Uh, if you go to the Nuba farms, that all that enclave have been sold out. So we do not even have a peri urban farming that uh, Kwanu Kuma envisaged and wanted to put together to as a mitigating measure for the the, the urban areas. Mm. So we need to be very strategic how we look how fast we are losing our agricultural lands. National Service has is a unique um, uh, organization. They can use their population and drive a lot of productivity. But unfortunately, uh, much of this is not being done. They have Eastern region, they have the, the BA and the Northern region farms that they can expand. Mm. So they also need finance, they need support. They can't do it um, all alone, uh, right. or on their own. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, Anthony Morrison, thank you for spending some time with us here on The Pulse. You're still watching us. Uh, don't forget that we're back with more stories. We're paying attention to day two of the clock sack strike. Please stay with us. So let's shift our attention now to the labour front uh, because the civil and local government staff association strike action has actually entered day two. Day one uh, was characterised by long winding queues at public institutions as scores of people seeking government services were left stranded. So what's the situation on the grounds today? Uh, well, let's start here in the Greater Accra region. My colleague Michael uh, Ni Ashali has been on the grounds gauging the impact of day two of the industrial action. The strike of the civil servants enters day two, and we're here at the Registrar General's Department to find out how the people who patronize the services offered here are really reeling from this strike. Many of them still come here and have to be turned away because the civil servants are on strike. Today they put up a notice, uh, a public notice, that says that well, the management of the uh, department wishes to inform its cherished clients that the department will be close to the business community from Thursday um, until further notice. Now, this is in compliance to the decision by the civil servants to go on a strike. What are you advising some of the clients, which I'll be speaking to one of them very soon, clients are advised to use their online portal for their business registration or dial the short code star 222 hash to renew their sole proprietorship businesses. So for those, and this is categorical, just for people who are wi willing to renew their sole proprietorship businesses. Now, not just them, at least the solution for these people, but not just them. There are others who are here to pick up their uh, operating certificate and all that, their licenses to do their businesses. We'll speak to one of them. Have you joined us pretty shortly? Okay, so what, what's your name? I'm Ob Obed Kofi Annan. Obed, so what exactly were you here to do? Uh, I think uh, some few uh, weeks ago, I think three weeks ago, I made online registration, business registration, and I was sent an email that the business certificate is ready, so I should come for, for it. So basically, I came here to take the certificate. And, and as far as that arrangement, today is the day you are supposed to pick that up? Uh, yeah, yeah. T today, I think I was given today to come for the certificate. And you, you are here, what, what have they been telling you? Uh, I think when I'm about entering uh, the security, I asked me why I'm here and I explained to, to him. And uh, he told me that they are on strike. Uh -huh. so what was going to happen to you now? I mean, that's a certificate you definitely need to, to continue your business. Yes, I, I really need it. I, we, we plan of using it to register mobile money, I think today. And since uh, I, didn't, I didn't have it or I've not gotten it yet, uh, I think I have to go back. I'm not from Accra here too. Where are you from? I'm uh, Goomba West. I think Apam. Yeah, Apam. 
for, for areas that don't you have an office that you can do this business? Oh, we don't have a, a registrar general department at Central Region. So we, we, we turn up to that of Accra to do our business certificates. Obed, let me thank you very much. So Obed, like many others who have come here, would have to probably decide to go back home uh, because of the strike. We'll be checking some other um, areas where you have civil servants working. At the ministry's enclave in the central business district, where arguably a lot of business is transacted on behalf of government, the place is unusually quiet and empty of people. Usually, you'd find a lot of people um, up and down, moving in and out of offices, trying to transact one business or the other, or to make inquiries. That doesn't seem to be the situation here. Reporting for Joy News, Michael Ashali, Accra. Also, it's evident that the strike is biting hard. Let's check out uh, other regions as well. Joining us now from the central region, uh, Cape Coast to be precise, uh, uh, correspondent Richard Kojo Nyako has more for us. He's on phone. Uh, so, Richard, you visited some public institutions today. Uh, what did you find? Uh, of Accra, just that the pressure in Accra would be more because there is no reg uh, registered general department here. There's a lot of them who would be accessing that service would be moving to Accra. But here are the regional coordinating councils. And then the municipal and the metro assemblies, the civil servant here did not come. They put up a notice that they were on strike. And so people come and then they have to return to wherever they came from. So there are some services that the people can access from the various districts there and they have to move to the regional capital, Cape Coast, to access them. But uh, they come and then they see the notice that they are not working at the federal notice. And so uh, people got stranded in the mm -hmm. morning. It started from yesterday and just some of them claim that they have not even heard that the civil servants uh, are on strike. And so it, it really baffles them why there shouldn't be any notice or why they should not be told uh, beforehand that they were going on strike. And so that is the situation here in Cape Coast. How are residents receiving this? Well, so uh, they are distraught. They do not know why uh, the strike should happen in the first place. But um, others are also of the opinion that, well, there was an agreement that they duly signed. And so once uh, it's an agreement, uh, the two parties should respect them. And so whatever is in the agreement, they believe that each of them would have a case. And so whatever government should do to ensure that they return to their workplaces, they should do so that uh, they would uh, return uh, from wherever they are. Richard, thank you. Rafik Salam is joining us from the Upper West region. He is monitoring the situation there for us. So, Rafik, um, what's the impact of day two of the clock tax strike where you are? Rafik, you'd have to unmute for us so we can hear you. Yes. That's not better, Rafik, if you can hear me well. Uh, I'm, I'm asking you to unmute so we can get the point you're making. Rafik, if you can hear me, I'm asking about the impact of the strike today. Well, um, it, it appears that there's a challenge with Rafik. Um, let's now uh, take um, Nanayao Jima, who has been uh, monitoring the situation in the Ashanti regional capital. Uh, we'll come back to Ash the Ashanti regional capital. Ivy Setoji is also joining us from the Volta region. Ivy, what can you tell us? And um, most of the uh, offices in the region, uh, workers were not seen in their offices. Uh, some of them that spoke to John you said uh, they are going according to the instructions by their leaders to uh, stay home. A few of them that were staying in office, they were there uh, because there was something urgent mm. they needed to do. Uh, so that was why they were there. But they were going to immediately after they were done. Uh, so just a few people uh, or workers were staying in, in the various uh, offices, but most of them uh, were not in the office. How about the senior officials as well? Uh, it appears that they are not part of Clocksack, so you would expect that some of them... Hello, are... Yes, how about the senior officials as well? Uh, you would expect that some of them would, yes, some would of report. Them, some, right. of them were, some of them were in the office and some were also absent from West Bay. Mm. 
Ivy, we're grateful. Uh, let's take you to the Ashanti region. Nanaya Ojima is joining us. Uh, Nanaya, what, what more can you tell us about the Ashanti region? Uh, that's also another place where we understand that the industrial action has been biting really hard. Nana, if you can hear me, I'm asking about the impact of the strike today. All right, so members of contact remain on strike in the Ashanti region here. Um, when I spoke to the leadership of contact, they say they are yet to get a directive for the, from their leadership, national leadership in Akkad. So until this directive comes through, they will continue to um, remain on strike and uh, avoid the contact offices. When I went there, it seems a number of people in the Ashanti region so far are aware of the strike. So there were no queues or people in the offices of where these contact members were. So the, the, the strike action is still in force here in the Ashanti region. And what's the reaction to the development? Um, yesterday, the last time I went there, um, a number of people who had come for their service were, still, were stranded. And some people think that government should go ahead and resolve these issues so that these, um, um, the staff of course staff will be back to render the service that they render to the public. Okay. Now there are a fraction of the people in the Ashanti region who believe that um, their request shouldn't be granted by president because the, the, but the point you sign on to be, um, to be a staff of course staff, you should remain neutral and that government shouldn't give anybody an allowance for mm. such uh, purpose. Uh, and definitely we are keeping our eyes on this. Nanaya Aljima, thank you for giving us the latest from the uh, Shanti region. Upper West uh, is where our next stop is. Rafiq, earlier you were trying to make the point about uh, how this um, action is also impacting residents of the Upper West region. Um, blessed, uh, the situation in the Upper West region is not uh, different as uh, uh, experience uh, in other parts uh, of uh, the country. A place that the one municipality or the upper West region or the council, most of the workers uh, didn't come to work. Uh, a lot of meetings were scheduled uh, today at the yeah. SCC and also at the municipal assembly uh, hall. I couldn't even uh, come on. Even let me say the case of the an election for a presided member's election that was scheduled to take place around 9 a.m. and by midday they haven't even started other meetings. So workers are uh, somehow uh, are not really uh, those are today. When you move out of the the regional capital, the situation in other, uh, the other nine district capitals, not, not many people are present at work today. Uh, what, what election was happening or scheduled to happen and, and how come uh, that has, the strike has impacted the elections? Um, uh, this is uh, an election that was supposed to be a presiding member's election uh, to get some who preside meetings at the assembly. And then also uh, most of the senior uh, officers uh, do, uh, some do uh, come around. But there were some uh, meetings that were expected to take uh, uh, place and other host of other meetings before that assembly meeting uh, could, uh, could come on. And so because of that, it has uh, some of uh, the meetings that have been postponed because uh, you've seen uh, some of the workers are not, are not really uh, present. So entering some of the offices, the virtual entity uh, at the upper school of Kudete Castle and a few other offices around the uh, but I'm sure that you've been interacting with some of the senior officials as well. Uh, they are not members of Clocksack. Uh, what, what sense do you get from them? How worried are they about the uh, impact of the strike? Uh, you know, the work that uh, they are supposed, they told me that the work that they are supposed to do, uh, like their, their subordinates are claiming that they have to be the one uh, who will have to uh, be doing all uh, those things. Uh, I entered one of the uh, officers at the arena administration uh, where uh, the posts and the directors themselves uh, have to be the one uh, picking files from one office to, to other. You know, virtually they were the ones doing uh, mm. uh, everything. Mm. So it wasn't uh, good for them. Uh, quite a sad day, uh, indeed, in the Upper West region. Uh, we understand that negotiations are still underway. Uh, but let's hear now from Alexander Albing, the chairperson of the Shanti Regional Chapter of Clocksack. Thank you, sir, for your time. Yesterday when we were interacting, you gave us a sense that once government is committed to release the funds for your neutrality allowance, definitely you will call off the strike. What's the update for today? Uh, if, if you can he hear me, Mr. Obing, I'm asking about the update on the negotiation with, with government. Uh, yesterday you were telling me that once government commits maybe on paper, that your, your payments will be released to you at a certain date, you would call off the strike. What's the update on that?
while you're still with us here on The Pulse, that uh, will definitely give you some updates uh, on the strike as we move on. But this afternoon as well, we're still um, keeping our eyes on the uh, police in, in the uh, northern parts of the country. They have arrested two suspects in connection with the attack on the new patriotic parties in the Sara coordinator for the Sisala West constituency, uh, Musa Idrisu. Mr. Idrisu sustained severe machete wounds after some alleged party thugs in the constituency attacked him following uh, internal wrangling within uh, the new patriotic party. Doctors operating on the victim say he is now partially blind. That's the latest we are getting on him. Here's a correspondent, uh, Rafiq Salam, uh, giving us further details on this. The 43-year-old Sasala West constituency Nasara coordinator, Idrisu Waleika Kinsasa, was ruled out of the Bulu hospital with an ambulance for further medical attention due to the multiple machete wounds and fractures he sustained allegedly from some MPP tags of a polling state in executive elections. You know, the, what we call the lower jaw. He had sustained two fractures, I mean, in the jaw. And uh, also, he broke the two bones in the right forearm and then one bone in the left forearm. And uh, multiple lacerations. One on the left lower limb the other on his uh, forehead, and then one on his uh, right forearm. Medical director of the Upper West Virginia Hospital, Dr. Robert Amasia said, due to the varied degrees of injuries, including him partially blind as a result of gland trauma, the surgery and treatment was done in phases and with different surgeons. Exactly what we did was um, the maxillofacial surgeon fixed the jaw and then the, myself the orthopedic surgeon i fixed the right radius and ulna the left ulna and then we repaired the tendons that uh, were lacerated how many minutes how many hours did you use to, 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 to fix so this was a combined surgery of a uh, orthopedics and the uh, maxillofacial so it took uh, almost two hours to get everything fixed he said it will take the 43 year old father of three some time for him to recover fully um what i think we need to also work on is um to have our uh, clinical psychologist also you know do some therapy on him because if a group of people attack you Apart from the physical trauma that uh, you will sustain, you have this emotional, uh, psychological trauma too. So it's a multidisciplinary approach that we are offering him. So maxillofacial, orthopedics, then the clinical psychologist. Uh, accordingly, he alleged that uh, he got also blunt trauma to the eye. The ophthalmology unit too is also handling that. So we are quite a number of uh, teams that are helping to attend to him. So we just hope that together we can support him so that he can get back to his original state. Meanwhile, in the Sisala West District capital of Bolu, there was a press conference that was held to counter accusations leveled against the upper West regional minister, Dr. Hafiz Bin Sali, and a host of other regional executives of the MPP on the dastardly and despicable act. The group, calling themselves Team Majid and led by Hudumwa, first of all, condemned the inhumane and violent attack meted out to the constituency Nasara coordinator. Them that act in no, in no uncertain terms, irrespective of, the, uh, irrespective of the magnitude of the crime he was committing at the time of the night, we believe strongly that he should have just been arrested and handed over to the chief, or better still, the police. They accused the constituency executives of not being true to their words, but rather engaged in hide and seek with the supporters resulting in the unfortunate class. Unfortunately, they could not complete the exercise and have agreed to start from Desme the next day. The consensus executives rather went to Fatu instead of Desme as agreed with the regional reps. The reps 
heard of that and cautioned them not to conduct any elections there without their supervision in the interest of fairness. But they refused and went ahead with their agenda, which resulted into the clash, the clashes leading to our supporters suffering various degrees of injuries. They also jumped to the defense of the Apostle Jam Minister and the security personnel deployed to the area. The consensus secretary cited security reasons as the, as the basis of not conducting elections at Kunkoko, Kusale, Desme, Puluma, and Kopuluma, and other communities. Now, if the regional minister deploys security to beef up the men on the grounds to support the committee to do their work, does that amount to abuse of power? No. no. Did the Constituency Secretary know exactly what abuse of power is? No. The Constituency Executives are aware they will lose this year's election in totality because the good people of Sisala West, because the good people of Sisala West MPP are tired of their lies, fake motor keys, fights, propaganda, and several years of autocratic leadership st uh, leadership style reporting for the news rafik salam Wa well there's an update on this speaking on news decks upper west pro for the ghana police service uh, chief inspector uh, gideon boating says two more suspects have been arrested in connection with the attack in addition to those two who were arrested initially mm -hmm. We have arrested additional two who are uh, Ali Du Wajia. Uh, they said they don't know his age, but he's a, uh, he's a, he's a former mm -hmm. with the police, and they give up Golu there. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he stays at uh, Domina Bra, okay. a section of Golu. Then uh, one, uh, my two man, the man. Also, age 60 years. Uh, yes, he's also a native of uh, the Gualu there, and then he is a farmer also. We are with the police, and we are we are we are interrogating them. Hopefully, we need to arrest additional people because looking at the picture, which was speculated mm -hmm. or circulated, circulated, mm -hmm. quote and unquote, mm -hmm. you know, we need to get more than the four. Okay. So the regional police commander, in the person of uh, DCOP, Mr. Peter in the Kugri, mm -hmm. has sent men out there. As I spoke to you yesterday, um, three days ago, and uh, today two men are still on the ground. Intelligence are being gathered for us to, to earn something better than we have achieved. Um, we are assuring the public that they should exercise constraint or restraint because police will not sit down and look for certain things to happen this way. With regards to the, with regards to the first sacks that were picked up, have they been put before court already? Yes, please. Uh, the two were, were sent to court yesterday. Uh, court, the upper was, uh, uh, the, 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 the one magistrate court was where we put the people, and then uh, before, and then headed, uh, presided over by his, was, his worship, Maxwell, Max the Brain, Citricou. And he reminded them to police custody to reappear on 4th of next month. So the, uh, the, the victim, Waleka uh, Idrisu, now a 45 year old man, now responded to treatment, and we hope that he, he gained more than he is mm -hmm. enjoying now. Okay, so Rafiq Salam is joining us back to give us some updates on this uh, story as well. Uh, we understand, Rafiq, that the victim's wife uh, is actually traumatized uh, and is also receiving some medical care. Uh, give us some updates on that. I'm told uh, that uh, the victim's wife is uh, she's highly pregnant and then also at the point of her uh, labor. And so once she had the information, uh, she wasn't all that uh, happy. Uh, she was shocked uh, to the marrow. And, uh, and she's also uh, currently receiving treatment, but she's not 
uh, at the hospital are do. Uh, uh, but the, do we know? Do we know if that's uh, likely to have some implications on 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 the pregnancy? Um, I'm not a doctor, but a part of the matter <laughs> is that you know some of these yeah. things that uh, happens. You know, they have a uh, a lot of uh, repercussions or ripple effect, and whatever that goes on uh, around uh, the family. Uh, you know, the 43 year old uh, Nasara Kodita is a breadwinner of uh, three children and also the host of other dependents and him. Actually, he's not from the Upper West region. Mm. He is from the Upper East region, uh, precisely uh, from uh, Boko. And so that is really the situation uh, here at the moment. And so everything is, seems not to be going on, on well uh, with the family. They are mm. really uh, shocked and they are really terrified about what really uh, transpired. Right, and, and Rafi, that, that's where there's a lot of concern about the general mood and, and the fear of some reprisals. Um, what, what are you picking up on the ground? Uh, the information that we are getting uh, on the ground is that uh, the police are up to the tax, the uh, intelligence uh, uh, bodies are at Bolu. Uh, you know, this is a place, uh, you know, uh, which is closer. It's just um, some few kilometers away uh, from the border in Burkina Faso. So, right. uh, speaking to the Upper West Regional Minister, uh, somewhere off camera, I uh, was telling me that the reason why they have taken some of these security men uh, to this area is about of uh, it's about what is really happening in Burkina Faso. So the fears of uh, of uh, people coming from Burkina Faso uh, to do uh, uh, some things on tour. So that's why they are not mm. let, letting any uh, stone on turn. The anything about that particular area, they are trying to build a facility so that the people in that particular community will be secured. Uh, and how about the elections itself? Um... What, what measures are the uh, executives of the NPP in the region putting in place on that? I'm, I'm told the elections are supposed to go on in all uh, parts of the region, all constituencies on the uh, 28th of, uh, of this month. I don't know whether, I need to know whether they have really uh, changed uh, the schedule uh, or that of Sasala West constituency uh, will be changed. Uh, but for now, uh, elections are supposed to go on uh, in the upper West region in all, almost all the constituencies on the 28th. They are still currently doing their police station executive elections uh, in some way. Some, uh, uh, you know, they are done on the quiet. Some, uh, you know, it's not just about uh, elections, but sometimes it's well, consensus. Well, so well the, the feeling here, are, the feeling here, when, and why I'm asking the question is because um, it's believed that there's some faults developing within the new patriotic party in that part of the country. Some people are beginning to take sides already. Factions are developing in that, in, in that constituency. So, uh, that's why I'm asking if there's a, a, a strict decision on whether or not the elections will go ahead. As for factions, uh, it's always in these political parties, especially the NPP in the upper region. The party has always been sharply divided. You know, if you even watch at uh, the press conference or the presses mm. that has, uh, that came from the Sasala West, we have Team Majid and Team uh, uh, Team Dramani. Right. You know, you know, uh, and so these are two camps or factions that are always at loggers, they are sworn enemies. And so even at the regional level, it's also uh, like that. And so for now, we are yet to know whether the regional executive of the party has put on uh, these elections on, uh, on hold. Okay. But for now, the party is sharply divided. The party is in shambles uh, in the region. And so people are really not happy about the way things are going uh, in the region, particularly the MPP with regards to these police station uh, elections. Mm. Uh, and the regional minister himself, uh, you were indicating to me how he's putting in place measures to uh, deal with the security aspects of this, but his name has also come up. Uh, has he been talking to you on, on whether or not he's uh, complicit in all of these uh, internal party wrangling? The Upper West Regional Minister, Dr. Hafiz Bin Sali, has financially and vehemently denied all allegations leveled against him regarding this issue of the Sasala West constituency. Uh, this morning, he met uh, the family of uh, uh, Waleka uh, at his office, and he uh, told them point blank. He told them point blank uh, that uh, he was not uh, interested, and in whoever becomes a party chairman in any of the constituencies, what he wants mm. is that he wants the security uh, of the region, he wants the people in the region uh, to be uh, secured. And he also uh, made mention that has never taken any decision any unilateral decision on its own, any decision that is taken by him in terms of security was done by the regional security at our castle. Mm. And so he's therefore surprised about the allegations that are being leveled uh, against him. But let me also tell you that he also assured uh, the family of uh, Waleka that 
they will get justice. He will ensure that justice uh, is delivered to them. And then the per perpetrators of this shameful, dastardly, and then also barbaric act are right. brought out to book. And so that's the assurance from the regional minister this right. morning. Members uh, or the family of uh, Waleka Idusu. Well, Sasa. Rafik, we'll, we'll have to uh, end, end it here, but Rafik is still monitoring the situation in the Upper West region for us. Thank you for the latest uh, update. Uh, experts are equally speaking about labor agitations in the country. In fact, they're expressing fears that any attempt by government to increase wages in the public sector could adversely impact the economy. The Trade Union Congress uh, over the last 24 hours has been mounting uh, pressure and making a strong case for an upward adjustment of the minimum wage, citing inflation is one of the root causes of the problem. There are concerns that giving Ghana's a raging economic challenge, it will not be appropriate to increase government expenditure at this point. However, leadership of TUC says there will be a series of unrest if nothing is done about their concerns. So the job crisis, you know, predates, you know, Ukraine. The job crisis came before COVID. Therefore, we think that it is not right to blame COVID and Ukraine for every job crisis that we have in this country. That is not right. And we are not going to accept that. The Trade Union Congress, which is leading organized labor, is very cautious and we always are biased towards dialogue. We hardly want to strike because strike is a very difficult thing to do. It's like war. So before we declare war on the employers, we have to make sure we have good reason. This time, we have the good reason to do it. Therefore, we caution that the employers must listen to us. And they should not just listen. They should also hear us because the workers of this country are suffering too much and we should not allow it to continue. Those who are in charge of this country must know that without workers, this country cannot progress. We have the National Tripartite Committee. The National Tripartite Committee has started the process towards determining the minimum wage for this year. For us, that is a do and die. We are going to make sure that Minimum wage for workers for this year should not be below inflation. And this will be extended to public sector workers as well. So there's a battle ahead of us. And I can see organized labor is ready to fight. And we are going to do that. Okay, so what would this mean to the economy of Ghana? If government decides to increase public wages and increase its expenditure in that uh, regard, Dr. Uh, Edu Oususa Kodia is joining us now. He's an economist at the University of Ghana. Thank you, sir, for your time. Government's already struggling to make up for its uh, expenditure allocations. Uh, but what will this mean if, if we increase um, the public sector wages? To widen the budget deficit. Uh, so the way out is for government to increase the revenue. You know, one way to close the, the expenditure revenue gap is to increase revenue. And so um, the, that is the best option for me now because government cannot cut down expenditure. And in any case, which of the expenditures are you going to cut? Workers are already demanding increments in their salaries. But it's, it's a legitimate concern because the productivity should always be equal to a real wage. So any time there's inflation, the real wage decreasing and therefore there must be a restoration of that parity where productivity must always be equal to the railway and and so the workers have legitimate concern it's not only the public sector workers i mean workers all over the country there are about 700,000 public sector workers and about 9.3 million uh, private sector workers so everybody is affected because we all go to the market mm. to buy uh, food stuff so when there's an inflation, the real wage reduces. Then the government will either have to find the money. But Doc, uh, I guess the concern increase. now... Other, uh, yes. Yeah, I guess the concern now is about being realistic. Is government in that position of making up for whatever in increments that may happen in terms of the public minimum wage? Well, the government has no choice than to increase revenue, isn't it? I mean, uh, we have talked about... Now, E-Levy is fast, but even with the passage of the E-Levy, there's still a budget deficit of 37 billion Ghana cities uh, for this year, at least 37 billion. So there are other ways of raising revenue. We have talked about the property rates. We have talked about the tax exemption. So I think the government should be serious about revenue generation to meet the demands of workers. I, I mean, 
uh, that is the best way out now. The, the best option for government to raise revenue to meet the demands of workers. Government cannot say that because there's no revenue, you won't increase the salaries of workers or you won't increase the minimum wage, which will affect even the private sector workers. The best way, the best option is for government to increase revenue to meet the demands of workers. What we know now is that labor unions are tying their concerns to inflation. Government is equally tying the inflation to what's happening to the external factors, i.e. the Russian-Ukrainian crisis. Is that, is that just um, some, sort, some sort of an excuse that government continuously um, is using uh, to evade its, the need to act now and to, and to provide for these workers? We know that drivers of inflation, city depreciation, uh, increments in uh, crude oil price, which translated in the increase in transport fares, which eventually affected prices of food items. We also have imported inflation from other countries. All these things are the drivers of inflation. We know. But the government is voted into office to solve problems. And so government cannot fold its arms and say, oh, we know inflation has been increased by external factors. We know that the Russia-Ukraine will have an uh, impact on inflation. But you have to resolve it. You have to solve it. This has affected salaries of workers. And workers are asking for the restoration of the parity of productivity and real wage. That is a concern. And so I think the government cannot hide behind the increase in inflation because you are the managers of the economy. You have to manage inflation. You have to manage all expectations. You have to manage revenue. You have to manage the expenditure. That is why you were voted for, and I'm sure they will do that. So honestly, if the government gives an excuse that the inflation was driven by or is being driven by external factors, I will not buy that because you are voted to resolve issues. I think that the best thing that for the minister or the ministry or the Bank of Ghana to say to Kenya is that we know what has caused the inflation. It is not, our, it's not wholly our fault. It's not 100% government's fault. Yes, we know there are external forces. But it must be resolved. And then the restoration of the parity of real wage and productivity must also be, resolved, uh, be restored. So government cannot hide behind it. And I'm not sure they are hiding behind it. I'm sure they will up their game and then uh, meet the demands of workers at least halfway. If they cannot increase salary by 19%, which is the inflation rate, maybe half of that should be okay for this year. And then going forward, they can deal with that. They should be in a better position to manage the situation. Dr. Edu is, a, is an economist with the University of Ghana, Thanks. the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization. Uh, that's... Uh, the Honorable Esla Ousu Ekofo has urged the young girls to take advantage of the existing opportunities in the digital world and embrace ICT. And uh, we know that, uh, according to the minister, she's uh, indicating that there's a better future awaiting these people. She made the call whilst speaking at the National Girls in ICT program held in Techiman in the Bono East region, where about 1,000 young girls uh, in the public basic schools in that part of the country were selected to be trained in ICT programming and coding. And Asabit has the rest of the story. As part of strategies to both ensure that Ghana achieves the Sustainable Development Goal 5 and Ghana's ICT 4AD policy on bridging the gender digital divide, the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization through its agencies, GIFEC, the NCA and the Kofi Annan Center of Excellence has expanded the scope of the Girls in ICT project. The program which involves the training of trainers who in turn train the girls and mentor them to develop passion for ICT is for the second time training 1,000 girls in the Bono East region. Osla Oswe Kufo is a Minister for Communications and Member of Parliament for Ablekuma West constituency. These are deliberate steps that we are taking to encourage more girls to consider studying ICT subjects and taking up careers in this very wide, exciting field in futures. So that it is not just a theoretical exercise. We bring women, female achievers who have excelled in this field either as trainers or as practitioners. So we have lecturers and we have those who are actually working in this field to come and share their experiences with the women. 
the girls during this mentorship program. So this is just to expose the girls to the wonders of ICT. But how were these girls from the 11 districts of the Bruno East region selected to be part of this project? Uh, girls education officers and the schools who choose the girls. We are not involved in the selection of the girls. So they bring the girls for the training that we facilitate. And they should know the criteria that they use. Those who are interested in it, those who are good in it, so that they will get more exposure to it. Bono East Regional Minister Kwesi Edujan lauded the Communications Ministry for the initiative and noted that the region is instituting measures capable of expanding the project to reaching many other girls across the region. You know, almost every part of the region is covered under this program. We intend to sustain it. The Honorable Minister for Communication has come to sow the sea. Regional Coordinating Council, we are here to water the sea to make sure that it becomes effective and factual. Mobile telecommunications giant MTN Ghana, who are partners to the Girls in ICT program, donated an amount of 10 million Ghana cities to aid the mentorship and training of the girls. Engineer Louisa Ama Sosu is a board member of GIFEC and a senior networks performance and SLA manager at MTN. MTN has really partnered with the Ministry of Communication and Digitalization on this Girls in ICT program. So we have, promet, we have committed a total of 10 million cities over a period of three years. And after, in addition to that, any time there's a program, we come with a team of mentors to encourage and mentor our girls in this program. Reporting for Joy News, Anas Sabit, Tichiman. Well, you're still watching The Pulse and still to come, don't forget that we'll be giving you some updates on Accra Lions versus Hats of Oak. Please stay. It's all coming up here on The Pulse. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the sports segment here on the Joy News Pauls with me, Oreku Ampofo. Uh, we'll be looking at the Ghana Premier League and getting ready for uh, week 26 fixtures. Uh, there's been uh, some controversies, and uh, there's a possibility RTU may not be playing. Uh, we'll be getting explanations later. But uh, week 26 in the Ghana Premier League has begun, and uh, that's a cry lions versus hard to folk. Uh, the, Heart of Oak currently lead by two goals to nil, thanks to goals from Daniel Efriye Bani in the first half and then Ejenim Boatin, who joined from Mediama uh, in the summer. And so Heart of Oak are currently uh, winning by two goals to nil and would return to winning ways after an unexpected 1 1 draw against the Elmina Sharks last week. On Saturday, there'll be one game between Great Olympics and Ashanti Gold. And then on Sunday, we have Ken Faisal traveling away to Dreams FC, uh, who have a new manager uh, in Ignatius of Osuse, uh, who once managed 11 Wonders and then moved to Mediama uh, for just less than 10 games after which he was sacked. And his appointment means that Karim Zito would now head into a consultancy role as Osei Fosu becomes the manager of the Still Believe Boys. At home, uh, will be BBNE Gold Stars as they face 11 Wonders. Brekum Chelsea host Adriana Stars and Wafa continue uh, to pursue their great escape from relegation as they travel all the way to Takwa to face Mediama. Elmina Sharks would be at home against RTU, uh, who we are not too sure would be able to uh, play that game due to financial uh, constraints. Asante Kotoko are back home and would look to return to winning ways after losing uh, in Tamale against RTU. This time round, they'll be at home against Ligon City. And then Bechem United, who collapsed against Wonders in the last 11 minutes, conceding three goals to lose 3 2, would also look to grab a win when they face Kerala United. Well, joining me in studio is Joy Sports, uh, Joel Botte. Uh, and Joel, how, how to folk uh, lead in 2 against Accra Lions? Is that a surprising result for you? Personally, that's not a surprising result. I think how to folk needed their results because they've struggled this season. And playing um, 
against Accra Lions. It's one that many expected them to get the result. And so they getting the win surprises no one, actually. 2-0 is actually a good scoreline so far, and hopefully they're able to better their goal scoring record so far this season. Well, they get into the top four, uh, but they're still miles away from Asante Kotoko. It almost looked like the, an impossible task catching their rivals at this moment. Would you believe that a second spot suffices for you know a club like us, a Kraha to folk, or you think the focus still remains to the FA Cup, which they're in the semi-finals? I think the focus should be in the FA Cup to get a title because that then still gives them something to hold on to, that they've gone through a season and they still have something to show for. Finishing second, no one really remembers who finishes as runner-up in any competition. It may be good for other teams that usually don't get to that position, but for a club like Accra Hearts of Folk, the target should and always be the title. But unfortunately, with the gap um, with Kumbasi Asante Kotoko lead, and it looks close to impossible. So second place should not be the focus. If they're able to get it, fair enough. But then they should try and focus and get the FA Cup title for themselves. And uh, there's been talks about Samuel Bodu. Uh, we had Charles Taylor come out earlier this, this weekend say that he doesn't mind what's happened this season. Boedou should be given a 10-year contract because of the job that he did last year. And he believes that continuity would bring more success because he's the man cut out for Heart of Folk. It's an opinion that hasn't been truly welcomed well by quite a number of Heart of Folk fans who are not pleased uh, with the former Mediamas coach's, uh, you know, his, his output this season. Where do you stand in this? Do you think that Boedou is still the man going forward for Heart of Folk and perhaps needs to shape a few other things or they need to look at considering someone else for the role next season? When it comes to football, it's a results-based, a results-driven game. And we know that everything, every decision that's take, taken by management is surely due to either results or possibly things that happen in terms of relationships and other, other factors. But looking at what Samuel Buedu has done in his tenure covering this season and last season, it's quite it's difficult to say you're going to sack a coach based on the fact that you feel he's done totally poor in a season. Yes, earlier in the season, they started poorly, but if you look at how they've progressed, the trajectory has always been the top and they've been climbing up the ladder. Unfortunately, they've struggled in away games and that has been a problem for them. And also goal scoring has also been a difficult thing for them. So judging from Taylor's comments, you could tell that he's looking more of a long-term project for Hasufu where they could come back or rise to the top and dominate the league for years. But then you, it's difficult to tell because looking at what other clubs do in the Ghana Premier League, it's purely results driven. If the coach is not performing four or five games consecutively, they usually get rid of him or, and get someone in just to get to um, a, a level where they're able to achieve what they need to achieve. So Charles Taylor's comments are purely on long-term long-term basis and I believe that's fair enough for him but for me it should always be on what the coach can get you for the season that stands at the moment. And you look over to the other side that's the House of Folks rivals Asante Kotoko. Uh, it looks like it's only a matter of time before they are crowned champions uh, not just because of what they've done this season but because of what the teams in and around them have done. On the weekend when they drop points in Tamale none of the top six teams won. Do you think it all but confirms Asante Kotoko would be champions in a matter of time because the teams around them are just not pushing hard enough. With regards to the teams surrounding them, I believe they've not played to the level that Kumasi Asante Kotoko have been playing to. So if they are not able to get results against teams that are on their level, then I don't know how well they can match up to what Kumasi Asante Kotoko brings. We've seen Kumasi Asante Kotoko play in games consecutively and get wins in, in in fabulous fashion, just as their name goes. So you can just give them the praise and say, this season is almost a done deal. Even though there are a few games left, it's close to they lifting the title. They also would, would wish they could get other titles, but focusing on just the Ghana Premier League, we can just judge by what they've done and say they deserve the title this season and no team has been able to compete in any other form. And uh, lastly, before we wrap up, uh, Frank Bella, 17 goals, doesn't look like anyone is catching him. Uh, there's been controversial takes on his importance and how crucial he's been for Asante Kotoko. Uh, 
is he your player of the season? And uh, what, what do you think uh, about the talks that, you know, the comparisons, especially with Eric Bequia and the former Ghana Premier League legends? Where do you think he falls in all of this? Imbela being a foreigner, I, I must give him credit. Not many have done what he's done so far. And it's remarkable. You can only give him praise because as a striker, we've seen strikers get 10 goals, 12 goals. But for him to go that far, 17, that's great. And so looking, looking at what Kumasi Asantokovtoko have achieved this season, you could tell that Imbela's goals have played a crucial role and he deserves all the praise for it. And I, I, I can go as far and say, yes, for Kotoko, he deserves to be the player of the season for Kotoko. But for other teams, there have been players that have really stepped up in terms of what they've done for their clubs. And so let's wait for the season to end and see, in comparison with other teams, what he's done in terms of achievements. But for me, in terms of Kotoko, he is the player of the season for me. All right, thank you very much, uh, Joel. Our Accra Hatafuka are currently playing at the Accra Sports Stadium and are leading Accra Lions by two goals to nil. <laughs> Uh, thanks to uh, goals from Daniel Banier Frier and then Ejenim Boating. A victory that will send the Phobians back into the top four of the Ghana Premier League. My name is Ori Kwampofo, and if you want some more sports updates, you can check our uh, website on my John Light for Slash Sports, or you can follow us on social media at Joy Sports GH on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And that's your sports for now. Well, so you're welcome back to The Pulse. Here's what you need to know. This is a big, big surprise for you. We're talking about this book today, and uh, guess what? It's monetizing your creativity and innovation, an introduction to intellectual property. It's by Sarah Nuko Anku. And uh, well, for those of you who haven't heard about this book and haven't seen a copy yet, there's something you need to know about this special material that we're about talking uh, here on The Pulse. So let me welcome Sarah into the studios. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the polls. So intellectual property is something that we've not discussed in a long while. Why have you decided to go into this and talk about it specifically as a subject in this book? So for the time in, I would say I wanted to coincide with the World Intellectual Property Day, which comes off next week oh. on Tuesday, 26th of uh, April. And the uh, theme for this year is on IP and the youth innovations and creativity. Mm, mm. So I took this opportunity to draft something for the youth, mm -hmm. targeting the youth, and, uh, but I believe it could be helpful for mm. all others who want basic understanding right. of the subject. Mm. I know that um, we are quite creative in Ghana, <laughs> um, especially the youth, they come up with all these um, ideas, yeah. apps, mm -hmm. and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, solving problems every day but uh, they don't seem to benefit much economically yeah. from their creativity mm -hmm. and that it's uh, it's sad because mm -hmm. um, in other parts of the world uh, people make it from their creativity mm -hmm. they make mm -hmm. a lot of money from their creativity mm -hmm. and the tools they use is the intellectual property tools uh, in fact if you look at our culture itself many would argue that look our culture is creative we could make yes. that argument wouldn't yes, we? Uh, but 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 it's not just about this book what's also amazing is that you're doing this and meeting a certain time schedule so that it comes out at the right time how, how exactly. tough was it or otherwise for you putting <laughs> very, together this piece very tough mm -hmm. um my team and i actually i have co-authors oh, from my wonderful. office my team from the office oh. uh Jerome Onigny, um, Blessing, yeah, oh, yeah. and uh, <laughs> Hello, Benedicta. Blessing. Yes, so we, we've worked really hard to mm -hmm. come up with this because, of course, of the timelines we yeah. have to meet. Yeah. Because there were suggestions that we should postpone. I said, no, this is about the youth. Mm -hmm. It's the youth and IP. Let's just force, right. let's get it done. Right. So, yeah. yeah we and, are. and we're proud that you're putting this uh, out. But there are many who may not know about you and may not see you the reason why you're deciding to do this. What, what motivated you to put this together and is it inspired by your background? Yes, it is inspired by my background. This is, a, I'm a lawyer, right. I specialize in intellectual property law. Okay. I've been in the field for five, quite some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the past, I realized that when you teach people IP, I, I teach also, I teach at KNUSD. Okay, right. When you teach or you, uh, you're a resource person for seminars, you end up talking to the people they understand on the spur of the moment, mm -hmm. but the next day they tend to forget 
what you talk about because right. probably the subject is not too friendly. Right. Right. So I thought that probably we should come up with something in a question and answer form that would be a, a resource, um, a reference book mm -hmm. kind of. Mm -hmm. So if somebody develops something, creates, yeah. the person can just refer to that particular book yeah. and ask, oh, what am I supposed to do when I create something, right. when I have an innovative right. idea? And then if I have it, um, how do I make sure it is something that can be protected yeah. and I can commercialize and make money yeah, out of it? Right. So then you just pick the book again and right. just flip to the pages mm -hmm. where you have that information. Mm -hmm. And then when you have it protected, you are commercializing and somebody is stealing your ideas. Mm -hmm. Somebody is stealing what you have. Mm -hmm. What do you do? We have um, enforcement measures also oh, okay. in there. Yeah. And then, of course, we brought up this. Uh, trending issues about AI, mm -hmm. blockchain, yeah. uh, NFT. And what's trending now? Yes. So <laughs> it's good that you are IP, covering yes. all of this mm -hmm. in this special book. And very often when the subject of intellectual property comes up, a lot of people feel it's just about the big brands and, and, yeah. and not about small creativity. Yeah. Uh, what is it that people discover when they read this book about individual ventures and not necessarily thinking about the big brands out there? They would know that the big brands started small. Wonderful. Yeah. So you can also start and mm -hmm. be a big brand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did Facebook get to be Facebook? Right. That is small. You can start. Whatever you have now, if you take the right steps using the right tools, you can make it. Mm -hmm. You can't say you are unemployed when you have so much ideas. Right. We should, you should be guided uh, with all the information and the resources that you need mm -hmm. to make something out of those ideas that you have. Mm -hmm. If you've developed an app that can really be useful to society, mm -hmm. yes, if you put it out there and it's well protected, the giants will not steal it from you. Yeah. You will protect it and the giants will come to you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for a license or may even want you to sell to them. Yeah. And that's a way of making money mm -hmm. as a young person. Mm -hmm. So we make money from our creativity and innovations. Yeah. I'm, I'm convinced already. <laughs> In fact, I'm, 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 I'm getting really interested. I need to read this. But who else is this book good for? For researchers and okay. for uh, students of intellectual property, right. law, and practice. Mm -hmm. Because um, this book gives you the fundamentals, the basics mm -hmm. in a simplified language, friendly language, mm -hmm. so that it is easier for you to understand. Right. It has this, um, it, it is, it is a, a school setting mm -hmm. where you have a mythical god of knowledge, Kweku Anansi, okay. being the resource person. So the students are asking questions and Anansi answers in a simplified language. So you get the foundation That's even right. unique. Yes. Right. So you get the foundation right, mm -hmm. and then you can go on to read your textbooks. You can, when you read your textbooks, the yeah. existing textbooks on IP, you, you understand better. Yeah. So you're yes. simplifying uh, yes. matters and, and making it easy exactly. for people to connect. To. But, exactly. but where can we get this to buy? Obviously, we need to, <laughs> we need to find the books on, on the shelf. Yes, right? the, that, that, that is true. For yeah. now, we, are, we have embarked on this uh, own a school project mm -hmm. because, of course, the target for now is for the youth and to make it accessible for the youth, quite a number of them may not be able to uh, afford or to, even if we sell it for one city, some may not be able to buy. Mm -hmm. So we are encouraging um, philanthropists mm -hmm. to purchase and donate to schools, to young ones, oh, so that they can okay. own the, the, the books and use it to their uh, benefit. So this is not necessarily about having a profit motive, putting out a book and then yeah. making money out of no, it. It's about it should, explaining. Yes, it should to get people, to the right, right people. Mm, so mm. if the right people cannot afford, yeah. then we are encouraging philanthropists to get on board. Donate to the young ones. Yeah, yeah. They will read. If you ask them to buy, they may not be able yeah, to buy. Yeah. So just buy and gift it to them, mm. and they will be forever grateful to you. So for now, the right. focus has been on this uh, owner school project. We mm. call it the owner school project. Okay. And after that, we are trying to arrange with these bookshops and then probably get it online mm. also mm. for sale. So this is a social course. In yeah. fact, uh, for those of you watching us, you need to get a copy of this. Or if you're an organization out there and uh, perhaps you want to support the course, just make sure you get this. It's monetizing your creativity, creativity and innovation, an introduction to intellectual properties by Sarah Nuko Anku.
and my team. Right, and your team, <laughs> right. So you need to get this. But Sarah, your final words as we wrap up on this. So um, we have the World IP Day on 26th. We have this book launch at the Kofi Annan uh, ICT Center. It's at 9 o'clock Tuesday. You are invited. Come and support this course. In fact, uh, the whole team here at Joy News <laughs> would definitely support such a good cause, but I'm grateful that you've been able to join us. So that's all we have for you in this package of the polls. My name is Blessed Sugan. Do stay here on the Joy News channel. Log on to myjoyonline.com as well. We have updates on all of our stories for you.